Hello, my name is Jorge Sanchez Delado and I'm from the Material Physics Center and I'd like to present my, my talk entitled The Usefulness of Useless Neuroscience for Improving Thematics Durability. In this talk, I would like to present you some results that we got by atomistic simulations, studying the stability of the silicate chains of CSA gel that were considered too basic and useless, but that they enable to design calcium silicate hydrated seeds that can be added to cementitious formula to, to, to accelerate the duration process and also were useful for designing tubermorite nanofibers that can be used to reinforce cementitious materials. The context of this study was the so-called strain retrogression phenomena by which uh, the CSA gel is transformed into C2S when the temperature is higher than 120 Celsius degrees. This process is well known within the oil cement industry. And what is important here is to notice that you are jumping from an element like CSA gel, which is contained of dimers and pentamers, etc. And the final product, the C2S, is composed only of monomers. So there is a depolymerization process. In order to study the depolymerization process, we perform atomistic simulations with the aim of getting some fundamental knowledge on the COC bond breaking mechanism and also on the impact of doping elements like aluminum, phosphorus, and boron. This computational study has been published by Roman Dupuy et al. So in case you want to know more about the details that I'm going to present, you can go directly to this paper. In this slide, I present briefly the methodology. This was based on carparinal molecular dynamics with quantum resolution. And also we resorted to metadynamics for capturing rare events like the bones breaking processes and providing a good description of the energy landscape. And that means the energy barriers. The system we employ was a CSGL composed of dimers to which we added calcium hydroxide molecules to get a calcium silica ratio of two. Later, the metadynamics formalis was employed to analyze the bone breaking process. And we did it by evaluating the free energy as a function of two variables. On the one hand, the distance between one silicon and one oxygen, which is served by the dimer, this distance, DCO. And on the other hand, the distance between this silicon atom and the oxygen, and one oxygen atom of an hydroxide ion. This hydroxide can come from self-ionization of water, for instance. This slide represents probably the most important results of this talk. Here we represent denary as a function, denary as a function of the two mentioned variables on the one hand, the DCO and the DCOH. And we can learn from here that the bone breaking mechanism is composed of two step process. Initially, NOH is a protein the silicon, the silicon actor capture the OH forming a pentacoordinated state, and later this dimer with a pentacoordinated state is split into two monomers. I will also to notice that here the key energy barrier is the one from jumping from this dimer with a pentacoordinated state to the two monomers. The key energy barrier is this one, the larger energy barrier that must be overcome, and it's around 0.1 electron volt. We repeated 
the same study to systems containing aluminum atoms. And the first thing that we notice is that the process was very similar. And again, a two-step process, where firstly, an hydroxylation process can take place, and later there is a split into monomers. But here there are two points that are relevant. Differently to the previous case, now the pentacoordinate state has a lower energy than the first one, the, the initial one, dimer one. So it means that this pentacoordinated state is stable. Besides, the energy barrier now is much higher than in the previous case. In fact, the energy barrier now is around 0.15 electron volts. Later, we study the case of phosphorus atoms, and again, a two-step process could be noticed. First, an hydroxylation process, and later, an splitting. But here, there was a very important difference. The pentacoordinate state that is formed here, in this case, is extremely distorted. Something which is evident by looking at the energy is quite unstable. And here, in fact, the key energy barrier is the barrier in relation to the hydroxylation process, which is very high and is around 0.20 electron volts. Finally, we analyze the case of boron, and we notice that here, differently to the previous case, the process is just a single step process. In fact, now the hydroxylation process couldn't take place, and the only barrier that we have is the barrier of a splitting of a dimer into two monomers. And a barrier now is just only 0.12 electron volts. But what is important here is that no direction process could take place and no penta coordinate state could be formed. So far, we have seen that basically there are two main mechanisms to stabilize a gel. You can either increase the bond breaking energy barrier or you can avoid hydroxylation by boron and phosphorus. And you can understand slightly these, these two different mechanisms and these two dif and these different behaviors in terms of the silicon, the, the, the silicon oxygen or aluminum oxygen or phosphorus oxygen or boron oxygen distances. Aluminum oxygen distances are larger than the one of silicon, whereas in the case of phosphorus and boros, the phosphorus and boros oxygen distances are much shorter. So this kind of hydroxylation process is much more complicated. So we're quite satisfied with the results that we obtained through these atomistic simulations, but they were not sufficiently appealing for the funding institute because the project was cut. The results were considered interesting, interesting but far away from an immediate utility. And before we were called, they needed to optimize the limited funding resources to projects closer to market. Needless to say that these basic results immediately opened the door to design calcium silicated rates, seeds, something that can be very useful in order to accelerate the hydration process and to get a much better initial mechanical properties of cementitious composites. And in particular, just by implementing together the two mechanisms, the two mechanisms by putting aluminum for increasing the bone breaking energy barriers and putting also minus amounts of phosphorus or boron to avoid hydroxylation process, we succeeded in designing this kind of seeds. And the recipe was very simple. The use of byproducts like fly ash and acetylene line slurry plus minus amounts of borax and phosphorus pentax as a source of boron and phosphorus, respectively. And later, 
we subjected the materials to an hydrothermal treatment at temperatures around 200 to 250 Celsius degrees for two to four hours long processes. In this slide, I present the X-ray pattern that is found when not doping elements, when I doping, I mean not neither boron nor phosphor are added. And as you, as you can see, no tubermorite fingerprints appear. In fact, the calcium silicate hydrate phase that is formed is the expected one, is the calcium, the C2SH. However, when we put minor amounts of boron or phosphor, the peaks of tubermorite emerge. Of course, we tried the product that we obtained by this simple method as nucleation seeds, and it worked. In fact, we observed that the initial mechanical properties increased dramatically more than 300% at one day, just by using minor amounts of these elements. And what is worth noting is that the process is cheap and very scalable. So what was considered as useless science turned out to be applied science and technology. In fact, this technology has been recently awarded by the European Association of Research and Technology Organizations. Let me illustrate how the concept or the excuse of optimization of resources can be stupid if the wrong metrics are employed. This is the story of a chairman of a company that, who had a ticket for enjoying the Supers and Finnish Symphony, but he couldn't go, so he passed the invitation to the quality manager of the company. So the next morning, the chairman asked him about the concert, but this, instead of few plausible observation, he said to him, I have a report. This is the report. For a considerable period, the old players had nothing to do. The numbers would be reduced and the work spread over the whole orchestra thus avoiding peaks of inactivity. All 12 violins were playing identical notes. This seems unnecessary duplications, and the staff of these sections would be dramatically cut. If a large volume of sound is really required, this could be obtained through the use of an amplifier. Much effort was involved in playing the demi covers. This seems an excessive refinement, and it's recommended that all notes should be rounded up to the nearest semi -quiver. If, it, if this were done, it would be possible to use low-grade operatives. No useful purpose is served by repeating with horns the passage that has already been handled by the strings. If all such redundant passages were eliminated, the concert could be reduced from two hours to 20 minutes. In light of the above, one can only conclude that had Suber given attention to this matter, he probably would have had the time to finish his symphony. Now let me move on the following apply applicable consequence of the basic knowledge that we got from atomistic simulation, and it has to do with the concept of cementitious nanofibers. Of course, cementitious nanofibers are appealing since, since they are fully compatible with cement matrices, and of course, they don't exhibit corrosion problems. In this context, tubermorite is intrinsically a nanofiber, at least natural tubermorite. The problem is that if you try to synthesize in the lab tubermorite, what you get is not tubermorite in the shape of nanofiber, a fibrillar shape, but you get foils and flakes. 
of course, this has to do probably to the time of reaction. In the lab, you can wait for hours, maybe days, but you cannot wait for geological times, let's say hundreds of thousands of years. So one might be tempted to try to accelerate the reaction process by heating the system or to put in some, or increasing the temperature. But here, the thermodynamics is again an obstacle, basically because if you raise the temperature, instead of getting tabermorite, you get sonolite, because tabermorite transforms into sonolite at temperatures higher than 130 Celsius degrees. So, can we overcome this thermodynamic obstacle? We think so, and it is based on supercritical fluid reactions, and in particular, in supercritical hydrothermal reactions. Supercritical fluids have properties between those of gas and liquids, and they appear very high pressures and temperatures. In the case of water, for instance, with this diagram, the temperature is around 375 Celsius degrees and pressures about 22 megapascals. The good thing is that the synthesis and their supercritical fluid media has numerous advantages. In, in particular, what is very important is the reaction is much faster. It's around 1,000 to 10,000 faster, and also you can play much better with the properties of the final product. Besides, there are other subsidiary advantages like it's environmentally, environmentally benign, and also in theory is quite scalable. Of course, the physical properties of water in supercritical state are very different to those found in ordinary water. In this figure, I represent two physical variables as a function of the temperature, and the supercritical water state corresponds to these areas highlighted in blue. Here, the density dramatically is dropped when you pass the, the supercritical state, and in supercritical state, you can find water with densities below 0.1 centimeter uh, grams per centimeter cube. The same happens with the, the electric constant here. You can jump from values around 80 at normal temperatures, conditions, to values which are around 10 or below 10. So at least eight orders of magnitude lower. In the case of the viscosity, you see there is a fundamental drop, and you have negligible uh, viscosities in the supercritical state, but it's not so important here, the supercritical state. But what is important for your talk is the ionic product, which is represented in this. You can see that just by passing the supercritical state, the ionic product decreases dramatically. In fact, you can get values below 10 to minus 22, so or, or lower. So in fact, you can find very quickly a huge reduction in the amount of OH and, pro, and hydronium ions in, in the media. And this means that in theory, the amount of OH available in supercritical water state is very low. So it means, as a consequence, probably the hydroxidation process are somehow avoided. We thought that it was a good methodology in order to incorporate both things, the aluminium for raising the barrier, but also trying to avoid the hydroxidation process. And indeed, by subjecting the typical materials employed for synthesizing tobermorite under supercritical uh, 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 state, we employ supercritical conditions by putting 400 Celsius degrees and 23 megapascals, and we achieve in extremely short period of time, in fact, 10 seconds, extremely pure crystalline and nanofibrillar tobermorite. This was published by Marta Diez and collaborators. 
so let me go to the conclusions. The stability of CCGL depends on the stability of silicate chains. In this depolarization process, there are two different mechanisms, the hydroxidation bond breaking. Bond breaking barrier can be increased by, for instance, adding aluminum atoms. Hydroxidation process can be decreased by either doping the atoms with elements like boron or phosphor, or, well, or lowering the OH content, like, for instance, subjecting the system in supercritical water state. Finally, guided by this basic knowledge, applicable CSHGLs and tobermorine nanofibers could be synthesized. Finally, let me convey a simple question. Do you think that in deep studies on candles may have led to light bulbs? Of course not. But it's important is that in the long term or in the short one, in some, in some cases, the useless knowledge can be extremely useful. I am presenting results that have been done by many people. In particular, they are under the umbrella of the Bastrit Initiative and also under the umbrella of the University of Bordeaux. Thank you very much.